you all. On behalf of the Area Agency on Aging, Pasco Pinellas, I welcome you to Aging on the Sun Coast. The Area Agency on Aging is driven by the goal to improve the lives of all older adults. And we plan and provide services for the elders of Pasco and Pinellas. We must keep in mind the special challenges facing the older adults who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, which commonly referred to as LGBT elders. On today's program, we will learn about LGBT elders, the LGBT Elder Initiative, and resources available through the Metro Wellness and Community Centers. For our first segment, I'm pleased to welcome Helen King, the Deputy Director of the Area Agency on Aging, and Chris Rudisell, the Director of Community Center Services for Metro Wellness and Community Centers. Welcome to Aging on the Sun Coast. Thank, Thank you for joining us Thank today. You. Thank you. Um, Helen, please tell us about the uh, Area Agency on Aging's LGBT Elder Initiative. This is a, a recent um, group that has been formed. Pretty recent, Marilyn. Um, in late 2012, we were, we, the Area Agency on Aging, was working on our area plan, which is setting goals and objectives for a certain period of time, multi-years. We, at that point, found out that the State Department of Elder Affairs, with whom we are closely aligned, had a couple of goals in their state plan um, for LGBT elders. And in my long history with the organization, I had never seen that before. I was curious as to how it happened. I didn't find out how it happened, really, but um, we then incorporated it into our area plan on mm -hmm. aging, which is our local objectives and goals um, for a three-year period for Pasco and Pinellas counties. We decided to um, do similar goals as what the state had. The state's goals were um, global in nature. Mm -hmm. One was to help educate the LGBT community on their aging needs. So it wasn't specific to LGBT elders as much as the broader age population as we're all aging, what are we looking at, long-term care services, et cetera. The other one was about educating service providers on the special needs of LGBT elders. So that was the state goals. Um, the area agency adopted similar goals. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, two of them. One was educating service providers on LGBT elder awareness. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other goal was really more important in my opinion, at least at the beginning of 2012 and 2013, and that was coming together with different communities, different um, partners that we had not had to begin to have conversations about LGBT issues, barriers, concerns. Um, very new topic for me. I was not unfamiliar with the term LGBT, um, but certainly not very aware of the barriers and issues that are confronting um, the LGBT community as they're aging. Um, it has been a fantastic opportunity to collaborate with entities in the um, Pasco Pinellas community um, to talk about this and to work on special issues. I think your point is well taken that before one can educate, before an agency can educate, the conversation needs to begin. Right. So this was the beginning of the conversation. And Chris, as I understand Metro Center, which has mm -hmm. an expertise in, in that area, um, is a major player in this collaboration. Right. I mean, as Helen said, it was great to pull together uh, not only our two agencies, but also you know other community leaders and other community organizations to address uh, the needs that exist within the LGBT elder community and there's still so much we don't know about that community and so much work we need to do to uh, really assess the the social and um, health needs of that community as a whole but we do know that you know national nationally about 2.5 million LGBT elders exist um, and you know just looking at St. Petersburg that's about 2,500 people based on our census data uh, from the last census. 
And on top of that, it's expected to double within the next two decades as the baby boom generation uh, enters the retirement arena as well. Um, top that off with the fact that Florida has no um, anti-discrimination laws based on housing, for housing based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, we know that LGBT elders face um, more discrimination in the in the housing field, in the social field, in services. They're more fearful of being discriminated against, so often they go back in the closet or don't receive the services they need. They, we, we know that they often don't get medical care because they're fearful of getting adequate services or being open about who they are. Um, Chris, I, I think those are good points. Um, in the beginning, some staff were questioning, um, why should we treat LGBT elders differently? They were seeing it as a special treatment. And I was having to really absorb many of the, um, quite frankly, the, the atrocities that have taken place in in our history, I didn't even know about it, and I know we're going to be talking about it a little bit on the second segment. Um, it increased my sensitivity greatly, and although I know the topic isn't something that everybody wants to hear and is equally ac ac accepting of, the bottom line that I told our staff was we are about decreasing and eliminating barriers to serving elders, no matter who they are. Mm -hmm. And if you accept that as being the mission of the area agency, then how can you not accept that as serving a population that has been um, biased and prejudiced and all barriers thrown in their way? We need to step up and become better educated about the topic. And that is the goal of our show today, that not as an agency, as a community, um, because this is a subject that has not been discussed over a period of time, although we see much discussion now of gay rights, mm -hmm. much of the community doesn't have an understanding of what has occurred for individuals. And, and during the second segment, which you alluded to, we are going to have two persons from the LGBT community who are going to talk about their personal lives. Um, and I think that will help us to better understand mm -hmm. um, some of the the barriers, some of the issues um, that you are addressing, trying to address. In that light, tell us about the Metro Center and where you are, what you offer. Um. So at Metro, we're constantly growing. First off, we're constantly adding more, more programs and services. Uh, but we do offer both social and um, health and wellness programs for the LGBT elder community. Uh, we have uh, weekly men's groups. We have uh, monthly women's socials and activities throughout the month. Um, in addition to fitness, wellness programs, and uh, even programs on financial advising and you know how to how to plan for ret for an extended retirement, uh, those type of services on a regular basis through our Metro Wellness and Community Centers located in St. Petersburg and Newport Ritchie. Um, in addition to that. We offer HIV services, prevention, education. We offer free legal counseling, free financial advice, uh, tons of services for the community, um, adding behavioral health services for the LGBT community. This uh, just announced that this month. And um, also our new LGBT Welcome Center, which will welcome not only tourists, but residents as well to come in uh, for um, a comfortable, safe space for people to socialize and and also get um, additional trainings and workshops as well. Are there programs or resources that are specific to elders? Um, that I'm yes. Okay. Um, some of the ones I mentioned, our men's group and our women's outings, uh, we have regular workshops and lectures that are specifically to addressing the needs of LGBT elders in our communities and our allies. Um, you know, we don't want to forget our allies or people that work in the, in the elder mm -hmm. field. Uh, we definitely want to invite them to come uh, experience our, our centers and learn about LGBT elders and about the community. I, um, I understand there's a homebound program, yes, right? Yes, thank you. Um, we have a friendly visitor program mm -hmm. which is made up of community volunteers and they go out to um, elders who are homebound or, uh, or 
socially isolated and provide a friendship. It's, it's really, it's called a friendly visitor program mm -hmm. uh, and it's about providing that socialization uh, that's so needed for a lot of LGBT elders. Well, I, um, we recognize as professionals working with an aging community that isolation leads to so many mm -hmm. problems. Right. It could be financial problems, it can be social problems, it can be health problems. And my understanding, and I think we'll probably <coughs> see some, some more light shed on this, that the LGBT elder is more likely to be isolated right. because of the lack of the formal uh, structure, family structure right. that might have been there. Well, yeah, you can often. imagine, I'm sorry, you can imagine that <coughs> The, the straight elders that are isolated and homebound mm -hmm. for all the reasons you just said, and you add into it that they now have to worry about um, admitting that some of their aging and frailty and dependency issues that are coming up, that they're fearful of letting others know um, their sexual orientation or their sexual identity. That is even, um, I can imagine a much more isolating feeling. So it's a mental isolation in some ways too. And where we see, you know, young people coming out at earlier ages mm -hmm. today and families being more accepting, not always, but in mm -hmm. general, a lot of our elders did not experience that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. don't have a family support system that um, that's taking them into their older years. And so they're left alone or to create their own families and many people move to our area to retire mm -hmm. and find that difficult. So often when I'm, when someone has come to me looking for resources, I will say, you know what, do you have family in the community? Um, but when we look at what I read, um, LGBT elders are three times less likely to have children. Um, they're two times more likely not to be in a, a relationship. So the answer right. to that question is more frequently no. So we need, we need to realize that as we're developing a structure of support. Um, and during this segment, during the next segment also, we will be running the telephone numbers of both the okay. St. Petersburg and the um, Newport Ritchie um, centers, as well as the elder, I'm sorry, the helpline. Um, our helpline, as an area agency on aging, we are serving people of all ages from a those who are disabled 18 and over, as well as those who are 60 and over. Um, so it is now the helpline and it is a resource that anyone can call to get information about um, services in the community. Um, as we end this segment, share with me, what's the next step that we need to take? Helen mentioned this in, on the fact that the next step is really education and educating the community on how to adequately and better serve the LGBT elder community. Um, Metro offers training programs um, entitled Project Visibility, where we can actually go into um, small to large businesses mm -hmm. or do individual community workshops uh, to teach people about LGBT cultural competency um, and how to better serve that community. Um, not for special needs or rights, but just to adequately serve everyone equally and make everyone feel comfortable. Um, this segment is coming to an end and we're certainly looking forward to talking with our guests in the second segment. I thank both of you for joining us and I hope our audience will be back with us to talk with um, two individuals who have lived a life through the gay rights revolution. Elder abuse is always devastating, but it may not always be obvious. Isolation, coercion, and the withholding of medication are only a few of the more subtle forms of elder abuse that occur every day to thousands of our senior citizens. Please join me in the fight to end elder abuse. Our elders deserve better. Visit the website of the National Center on Elder Abuse. It's time to speak up. During today's show, we are learning about the lives and challenges of older adults who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, commonly referred to as LGBT elders. For this segment, I'm pleased to welcome Joe Smith, who is a volunteer with Metro Wellness and Community Centers, and Val Paglia, the owner of the Institute for Elder Care Resources. Both are here to share with us their experiences. Welcome to Aging on the Sun Coast. Thanking, 
Thank you for joining me and our audience today. Um, during the first segment, we discussed some of the challenges uh, that LGBT elders are facing. But um, you as representatives of that community, you have lived through the his history of the gay rights movement. Val, can you share with us some of, from your perspective, that history? Absolutely, sure. Yeah, I think you can uh, date the gay rights movement beginnings back to 1969 with the uprising at the Stonewall Inn, which was a bar in New York. Uh, it was not uncommon for the police to raid gay bars uh, at that time, and this particular night in New York, the patrons of that bar decided that they were going to stand up and felt that this was not right, and so there were weeks of rioting. Uh, as a result of that, but I think that we can say that the beginning of the gay rights movement uh, stems from that uprising in 1969. That was the beginning of a voice. A voice, exactly. Um, and that voice is growing dramatically during that period of time. But when we look at um, individuals are not um, one-dimensional. You have, you have lived through and have an accumulation of life experiences through that whole period of time. Sure. Can you share with us, living sure. as a lesbian, what some of those experiences have well, been? Well, you know, I think our audience can probably relate to um, myself growing up uh, in the 1950s. Uh, the world that we had at that time uh, is a very different world than what we have today. Uh, you know, I am not alone in my age group uh, to feel that uh, I was the only one. Nobody else felt the way that I felt back then because we didn't have the role models that we have on television today. Ellen DeGeneres was not, uh, you know, one of us at that point. And um, so we all grew up uh, feeling that we were the only ones and we had to make our way in the world the best we could. And um, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of caution, uh, you're very... Um, hiding. Yeah, you spend your life hiding. Uh, I really feel like I lived a double life. I had a professional life, I had a personal life, and it was very few and far in between where those uh, lives came together. And when did you begin to feel that you could have, that your personal life, who you were, could be expressed openly. Right. Well, you know, you can see society changing. Uh, my partner and I moved here in 1998, and it was really at that time. Uh, I'm from Chicago, and moving here at that point in time in my life, it was, it was time for me to just make the commitment to be open about who I was and possibly serve as a role model to others uh, who were struggling uh, with trying to do the same thing. But, you know, there still is a level of fear, a, a variable level of fear and caution uh, that you need to read your audience uh, because mm -hmm. this is not politically correct and acceptable, right. Joe, as you would right. imagine. How many years were you with your partner now? We've been together for 33 years. And you were just married? Yes, yes. Um, believe it or not, uh, things are changing so rapidly, uh, especially pointing to last year's uh, Supreme Court landmark uh, ruling uh, that struck down uh, the key provision in DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. Mm -hmm. um, there are now, to this date, I think 30 states uh, that uh, marriage equality is legal. And so my partner, my wife now, uh, of 33 years. We were uh, just married in Chicago. We went back home to do so, and um, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But for you, it must have been much more than a ceremony. It was a public declaration of a lifetime of commitment that was kept very private. Mm -hmm. Now, this is at a time when marriage itself through the broader community, perhaps doesn't have the respect that we would like for it to have. But when you have been denied that privilege, exactly, um, it it can oftentimes be more meaningful and taken more seriously. Right, the commitments as, that are being made. As my my wife now, I can say, as my wife says, uh -huh. being married, it's like finally being allowed to join a very exclusive club that you were denied membership in for no reason. And Joe. You all have been denied membership to many clubs, um, whether it's the club of having an, a, a 
your own extended family, children, or you know, being able to just you're not soccer moms or soccer dads. You um, talk with us about the discriminations and prejudices that have gone that you have endured and friends of yours have endured, so that we as an well, audience I, have a glimpse of this. I would agree with Val that, in essence, when I was young, I never heard of a homosexual. I never heard at all. And the first inklings I even had of hearing about them were these CD stories about boys hitchhiking on the highway and being picked up by, by a queer, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that there's nothing to identify with to say that I'm, so we, you feel very alone, very weird, very strange. And then when I was in high school, I was in Boston crossing the street and running across to go to a movie and these guys would roll down the window and scream out at me, look at the queer, look at the queer, just because of the way I ran and apparently I've sashayed or something <laughs> like that. Uh, back in that day, okay, back in those days, mm -hmm. today there's much more acceptance, but back in that day there was what was called homophobia, the fear of homosexual, that was prevalent in our generation. We, in, among our age group, including our audience, all right, are the most homophobic generation of any generation since then. We were the f last generation born after the, before, excuse me, before the sexual revolution of the 1960s. So for us, all sexuality was evil, dirty, rotten, and bad. So that now, when we age and we go into senior services and homes, mm -hmm. I have a friend right here locally, I'm not going to say where, who's 72 years of age, who went into a subsidized housing, federal government money, therefore non-discrimination allowed because of his sexual orientation, who had to go back into the closet to play bridge, to be involved in any of the social life. His contemporaries there, again, he could not be part of the club. If the, club, had, uh, the club's norm is you must think and be the way we are, which is homophobic. And he then has to weigh whether he himself can be true to himself or whether he oh, can much have more, these connections. Much more often, it's not a question of being true to self. It's a question of I have X amount of money left to live on, and these is, this is what I must put up with okay. in order to endure uh, living. I don't think it's that kind of a choice freedom of selection. There are other examples of it as well. I mean, in, in nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, if a partner comes in to visit a partner who's sick or a, a resident, sometimes they're treated. I, I had a friend who was, well, it was a double whammy. He was white and his partner was black and his partner was in a nursing home and the staff treated him terribly, both because it was an interracial couple, but because they were gay. We are forced to go back in the closet five times less likely to use senior services. Why? We're afraid. Even in my men's group, the men's group at Metro, excuse mm -hmm. me, even at the men's group, we've talked about, don't go into that place. Boy, they're homophobic. We, we name senior living complexes in St. Pete and say, just don't go there. That's, that's homophobic. Word of mouth travels, and we are frightened to use services because we don't know how we'll be treated. The education that Chris and Helen talked about at the beginning is so very important so that we understand that there are these fears and learn how to be a welcoming community. Right, right. Um, you are, are professionally a, ca a caregiver. Your business is in, in the business of caregiving for elders. Right. Um, you are finding this, that those who are LGBT are not they are less likely to access services? That... They're less likely to access services, mm -hmm. and they're also less likely to have that, I believe it was discussed earlier in the segment, that family uh, social mm -hmm. support network mm -hmm. uh, from which to draw from. Uh, so that's definitely you know, a barrier that we need to uh, overcome, and I think education is probably one of the best ways to do that. Uh, I am encouraged, though, with this younger generation mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sexual identity, sexual orientation, uh, it seems to be so much more fluid now. Mm -hmm. um, they, you're not pigeonholed as much as, as in the past. And I think that with a certain level of education for the staff in these facilities, uh, combine that with courage on that elder's part to live a true life and be who they really are. Mm -hmm. and. I think you can be a role model uh, to the staff and help educate them that we're really no different than anybody else. We have illnesses, we have diseases that are just the same as any other uh, aging individual. So, um, very important message. And to to empower someone. 
to be a positive spokesperson and a positive role model. I think, you know, so often as we age, there is the need for services, particularly if you don't have that informal family support system. And we think, oh, you know, if we can get a homemaker going into the home or, you know, care, the Area Agency on Aging is all about funding services to provide quality care in the home. But I have to stop to think that the home may have been the private sanctuary for mm -hmm. someone who has been Correct. living, um, has not been part of the club. Um, and now mm -hmm. we have someone crossing that threshold. Does that present, is there a fear I, there, it, Joe? It, of, it certainly of can. Judgment I mean, of, there's, sure, if someone comes into my home and there are pictures of my partner, are there other kinds of sexually graphic things that might not conform to what their perception is? Oh, yeah, very much so. Very much so. I mean, there's. <clears throat> It's out there. It's real, and, and it, it is our generation. It's our generation's thing. I think it will not happen in ten or fifteen years. But my my plea, actually, to this audience is to build on what Chris had mentioned about the mm -hmm. friendly visitor program. Okay. Isolation, isolation. The, the largest population of suicide in the United States of over sixty-five is gay men over seventy. It is isolation. It is isolation. The Friendly Visitor Program is for LGBT, but for anyone. So if any of your audience knows of anyone who would like to have a visit from a gay or a lesbian friendly person, call the helpline. Let us know. Okay, and we will be running those telephone numbers again during this segment. But by calling that number or, or coming to the mature men's group or the women's group, you can have a conversation about the fears that you have, perhaps find out about resources that are more welcoming in the community to start bridging some, make a bridge over some of these barriers, have the support that is needed, um, as opposed to being an isolated individual taking on um, the community, um, taking on these issues by themselves. We could loop back actually to the L LGBT elder initiative that's out of the Area Agency on Aging. We're attempting to come up with resources and lists of information about LGBT friendly kinds of places that people can have comfort in going to. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a task and it's very hard to define what that is, but the movement is there. The resources are out there. There are LGBT friendly kinds of resources. And society is changing. And we can't forget that. Um, yeah. This is no longer uh, a, a time when homosexuality is considered a psychiatric disease. Right. You know? Um, this is a time where communities, uh, workplaces, healthcare facilities are uh, becoming more aware of the importance of having a new standard. And, and thank you for sharing both the vision that there is today but also the journey that you have traveled. Um, I think that is one of the best ways that we educate our audience um, and I thank you for, for sharing those experiences with us. I hope uh, that you as an audience have learned much from our show today. Hi, I'm William A. Pother. I play Ethan Rahm on the TV show Lost. Let me tell you about a truly lost population. Every single day, thousands of our elderly citizens are subjected to abuse. Emotional, financial, physical. Worse, the majority of people who commit these acts are those closest to the victim. Please join me in the fight to end elder abuse. It's time to speak up. Our elders deserve better. You're watching PCC-TV, Pinellas County Connection Television, a division of Pinellas County Communications.